Hi again, it's Ryan Miller with that Interactive. We're going to dive into a topic um, I think is really important to a lot of the practices that we serve, which is uh, minimizing the impact of no-show rates on the consultation schedule. Now, a little bit about this video before we begin so that you can decide if you want to proceed. Um, this is a uh, video that's appropriate for our medical clientele, specifically clinics and practices. Um, it deals more with clinic oper operations than it does with uh, marketing, which is a little bit atypical for our segments. It's going to be most appropriate for the managing or owning doctor or the practice manager. Now, the big question here that we um, hear when we talk to our clients these days is, where are my patients? I think for a lot of clinics, it seems like no-show rates are on the rise. So um, what I did is I reached out to five industry experts uh, to um, practice management staff from some leading, some leading clinics, uh, as well as some uh, practice uh, management consultants, and ask them this question, how do we minimize no-shows? How do we get that number down? So the contributors that uh, I have to credit for a lot of the great content in this presentation are Charlie Sheridan. She's the director of Marine and Plastic Surgery. That's the office of Dr. Grant Stevens. Uh, Marcia Huseman, who's the patient coordinator for Dr. Gustavo Galante. Um, and then, of course, Marie Olison. Many of you will recognize her name. Uh, she's the CEO for La Jolla Cosmetic Surgery Center. Um, we have uh, input from Tracy Drum. She's the vice president over at IF Marketing. And then finally, Karen Zupko. She's the president of Karen Zupko and Associates. I have to thank all of them for their contribution to this particular presentation. Now, interestingly enough, when I approached e each of them, I, I had a, a flawed theory or some flawed assumptions on which I based a lot of my thoughts about no-shows. Um, you know, the first one was the idea that no-shows for web-based leads were always going to be higher than, say, no-shows for word of mouth. And that, you know, because of that, as web leads become a, a greater and greater portion of all of the leads coming into the clinic, that no-show rates necessarily had to climb. And to a person, every one of the experts that I consulted said that that just wasn't the case. That no-show rates for web leads could be as low as those for word-of-mouth referrals or any other source of, of uh, new patient inquiry, and that they don't have to climb as, uh, as web leads become an ever greater portion of all of the leads coming into the clinic. So I think Marie Olson actually said it best, and I'm going to read her quote here, so excuse me while I look at the screen. The root cause is the failure by the practices to engage prospective patients and meet their needs prior to their arrival in the office. Practices need to invest time as well as money in their internet leads. Now the idea here is, is pretty straightforward, which I think what Marie is saying is you need to develop a relationship. You need to serve and connect yourself to potential patients before their consultations. And if you do that, then your no-show rates um, are going to be fairly consistent across all referral sources. So um, I asked them each to define and, and kind of categorize the factors that drive no-show rates. And let me run you through the feedback that they shared. Number one, and this is something that I think everybody's going to identify with, is schedule. So patients are forced to wait, this is a, a quote from Karen Zubko, more than five days for an aesthetic consultation or calling multiple practices. So if you have to book a patient too far out into the future, you can guess that they're going to see another clinic and that you may get a no-show out of that. Surgical preconditions came up, and a lot of our experts talked about um, things like obesity or smoking, preconditions that might uh, um, make contraindications for surgery, being factors that discouraged patients who were properly consulted by the, on phone from actually showing up in person. Uh, and I'm also lumping into here things like financial preconditions, patients who um, either don't have the money or didn't qualify for financing. Those are patients who also might no-show. Um, one of the big ideas that we saw come up again and again with the experts was a lack of respect for the doctor, or more specifically the doctor's time. Uh, you know, patients uh, who may have only had one brief touch with the doctor or the clinic you know, that being seeing the doctor's photo and profile on the website, really don't have a reason or the background to respect the doctor at that point. And of course, busyness is always going to be a problem. Uh, patients leading busy lives uh, and simply forget or um, aren't able to manage their day to keep their appointment. But the big one, and I think this is the one that is perhaps most important for all of us to take, um, take very, very seriously, is the lack of engagement. Um, the lack of a, a full and formal relationship with that patient before they come into the office that ultimately lets them, um, lets them slip off on us, lets them fail to keep their appointment. So what I'm going to nail down here is we're going to move into a section of best practices. These are ideas that were shared by our experts specifically to help you minimize your consultation no-shows. 
So um, let's break it down and address each one of those five areas. Now, as it relates to schedule, Charlie, I think, Charlie Sheridan had um, one of the, the strongest bits of feedback in this area. And her quote here was, each office's no-show rate will be different but it's dependent upon their commitment to faithful follow through. So um, your commitment, your investment in following up and following through with that patient really is going to have a big impact on their no-show rate. Um, obviously, and this is uh, something that, that uh, um, has a lot of variations how it might be applied in your clinic, but you wanna make use of the time between your last phone call and their first visit to your office. So whether that's a couple of days or a couple of weeks, you want to seek ways to engage that patient meaningfully to keep them connected to your clinic. Now, for some of the practices, this is uh, simply sending reading material. For others, it's about having them fill out forms and um, uh, submit information to the clinic prior to their consultation to help you and them prepare. Um, you need to pick your side of the overbooking controversy. Now, this is, this is really a big issue. You know, a few of our experts pushed back and said, no, overbooking is the death of customer service in the clinic. That if you have a good day and everybody shows up, those patients who uh, demonstrated the behavior that you most want, they, uh, they showed up on time, are penalized on your good days. And they're penalized on your bad days because you've overbooked and now they're, um, you know, they're uh, being forced to wait or deal with a kind of a mis mixed mass schedules. Others really feel like a small percentage of overbooking uh, I think Charlie, in fact, advocated for about a 5% overbooking ratio, which translates into about one extra patient a day, is just about right to allow you to maximize uh, your provider, your physician's time, and still allow for some patients the inevitable no-shows. You'll always have some. We're not going to be able to reduce the rate to zero. So um, you need to decide which side of the controversy you stand on and apply your policy and test your policy. And then ultimately, and I think probably most of you already do this, maintain a waiting list of patients who are booked for consultation but had a very serious interest in being seen sooner than the date they were given. So um, if you do have a legitimate consult uh, cancellation rather, and you have patients on that wait list, you can call them and invite them to come in and fill those, um, those openings that appear in your schedule. Now the surgical preconditions, and this is a little bit harder one to speak to. You need to decide what services and what level of communication you want to offer to prospects that, that either have um, uh, some contraindication or something that precludes them from having surgery. Now for some of our clinics, we've heard stories that they go as far as to, for obese patients, to facilitate and coordinate, help them coordinate their, waste, their weight loss counseling, excuse me. Um, for others, uh, patients who may be involved in smoking, they connect them with smoking cessation programs. Um, but decide what level of service, how engaged you want to be with somebody you can't serve immediately, but that you may be able to serve in the future, um, and develop a, a program and a protocol around, uh, around your standard. Sharing price ranges over the phone can um, help to weed out patients with financial preconditions. And for many practices, facilitating financing is a great way to help there as well. That third point that we had talked about, the third condition of uh, or, or contributor to no-shows, is the lack of respect for the doctor. Now, again, this is entirely understandable. And in fact, I would say it's almost, um, well, we, we shouldn't expect a patient to have a lot of respect for and a connection to the doctor when all they've had is a couple of minutes of introduction on the website. It's up to us to really cement that relationship. So we need to articulate, you as a staff need to articulate the value of the consultation, the value of the doctor's time um, to a patient before they come in. We wanna to start to build that relationship and appreciation for what they're going to receive during the consultation. We also need to continually reinvest in credentialing the doctor. Now we, we endeavor to do this with great detail for all of our client sites, but it's not something that just happens online. This is something that has to happen in the initial phone call, in your follow-up emails, in the confirmation call that, that's happening uh, prior to the patient's consultation, where we really establish that the doctor is a rock star. If you think about it, um, it's really easy to no-show an appointment for you know, somebody who you don't see as important or somebody that you don't have a relationship with, but it's tough to imagine yourself not keeping an appointment with a dear friend or with a celebrity. And that's really what we want to achieve is either let the doctor be perceived as a dear friend or help them be perceived as a celebrity so those patients are inclined to keep those appointments. And then finally, um, and there's again, there's a little bit of a uh, controversy around the exact nature of the application, but all of our experts agree that charging for consults is a good thing. 
um, whether that fee be applied to surgery or not. And requiring a credit card to book that consultation is a great practice. Do be sure though that you clearly state your cancellation policy because you don't want to have a bad customer service event and get negative reviews because you omitted to explain to patients what happens to that fee that's paid in the event of their cancellation. Point four was busyness. And Marcia Huseman had a great point here. You know, we require a callback, she says, that the patient uh, is confirming that they plan to keep their scheduled appointment by a specific deadline. So in terms of uh, the way that you handle busyness or help patients overcome it, you know, you confirm, I think everybody probably does this already, all of your consults 48 hours ahead by phone. Now, I'm a big fan of letting uh, patients communicate and communicating with patients in the way that they prefer. So I would say by phone, by email, or by text, but in each instance, you do want to require some form of confirmation. In the case of a call, that would be a return call if you reach their voicemail. So in addition to that, what else do you do? Well, helping patients overcome what I would call obstacles of inconvenience is another great idea. Um, some of our experts talked about things like providing printed directions, offering instructions on how and where to find uh, parking on the day of their event, helping them come prepared with specific forms to minimize the total length and duration of their consults, setting expectations around how long the consult will last. So think about all of the things that are happening in that, that busy patient's life and how do you make their life that day, the event of their consultation, just a little bit easier. So some great ideas to ponder there and I'm sure you'll have uh, wonderful ideas to implement on your own. The last point, and this perhaps was the most important one, was the lack of engagement. Now, Tracy Drum is our, our final quote for this particular presentation. Um, she's the vice president over at IF Marketing, and I really just love this quote from our interview. The decision of whether a patient will choose a provider starts long before the patient walks in the door for that first appointment. And I really couldn't agree with her more. So when we talk about building engagement before the consultation, um, a couple of our experts talked about seeking language, see, seeking signals that that patient is really committed to the improvement of um, uh, their health, the improvement of their, their appearance, that they're signaling you, they're using language that shows this is something they're really committed to. Um, sending the materials by email or postal mail was something that, again, all of our experts agreed on. You want to, and you can use this as an opportunity to overcome obstacles of inconvenience if what you send them are forms. You can use this to credential doctors if you're sending a bio, CV, as well as uh, copies of media or links to media appearances. So this is a great opportunity to really engage them in that downtime between, uh, that again, that last call and their first visit to your office. And then and this is, I think, a grand idea. It's a little bit vague. But I think that it's a strong notion. It's one that's worth maybe bringing up at your next staff meeting, is how do you communicate with the goal of building trust or building confidence? As I was exploring this idea with the experts, they were sharing ideas like, um, you know, if you couldn't perform a procedure or if a patient inquired about a procedure that you didn't offer, you build trust by helping them find somebody else in your network that you trust, who you really believe could help them with that. Um, and you know, little things like that, like going the extra mile, answering the question when you're busy, taking the time to make sure that they're prepared for their consultation, um, not overstating what the procedure can accomplish, really carefully managing expectations, and building trust all along the way, um, again, from that very first call and email, is one of the best ways all of the experts agree that you can build um, engagement, a connection to the office before they come in. So let's sum all of those ideas up. So using scheduling protocols, using uh, uh, procedures inside your office, that will allow you to get your most promising prospects in as soon as possible are going to help you decrease your no-shows. Helping your prospects overcome their objections early. So sort of facilitating where they have challenges, overcoming obstacles with them is going to be a great, great tool. Establishing the value of the doctor's time and what exactly they're going to take away from your, uh, your consultation is an important part of the overall process. Um, making it easy for patients to arrive on time, so using uh, tools and automation to remind patients about when their appointment is going, to, uh, is going to come up. And then finally, driving deep engagement and working to build trust throughout the, that process really is going to be the last and the most important things that you can do. Again, as we sum up, all of the experts agreed you have it in your control to bring no-show rates down for all of the streams of inquiries that are feeding your clinic. Um, if you need help, if you need additional ideas, 
Um, please be sure that you reach out to your account manager here at Aetna Interactive. Um, all of our account managers are engaged and ready to support you as you endeavor to uh, bring your no-show rates to all-time lows. Uh, good luck with the process. If you want to keep on learning, you know that you can reach out to us and subscribe to our newsletter or friend or fan us on Facebook, and I'll thank you for your time.